Today on The Future of Everything, The Future of Prediction Models. So Yogi Berra was a Hall of Fame baseball player who became famous for his comments on various aspects of life. And among his very wise observations, a, a, a number of them are quite relevant to the modern era of data science and AI. Uh, these include, number one, you can observe a lot just by watching. Number two, half the lies they tell me aren't true. And perhaps the most relevant for today, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. So we are living in a period of unprecedented interest and ability to make predictions. And this stems really from the confluence of three capabilities. First, we have an increased ability in the digital age to make measurements about the behavior of people, devices, and systems. This provides a record of the past that is detailed and useful for thinking about the future. Second, we have novel statistical and AI algorithms that can map past performance into future expectations. And third, we have fast computers that can manage all this data and run all these algorithms to create predictions in a timely manner. We also have a thirst for these predictions from many sectors of society. Traffic patterns, can we predict them? Stock market fluctuations, individual financial performance, uh, repaying of loans, repaying of credit cards, individual job performance, health outcomes based on genetic and environmental exposures, and some of these applications are more controversial because there's work happening currently in predicting that, that a cha the chances that a person might commit a crime or that a person will skip bail. And these have generated lots of discussion. But all of these applications are grounded in predictive modeling, the task of creating a mathematical model of the outcome of interest based on measured features. We call them features because there are they're, um, little pieces of information about the past that you can use in your mathematical models. When these models fail, they can have serious comp uh, implications, of course. Uh, that's why we get stuck in traffic, we have our credit card denied, or we may um, have bad news about our health. Well, Professor Emmanuel Candice is a professor of statistics and mathematics at Stanford University. He studies predictive modeling with a focus on uncertainty in models, transparency of models, and assessment of risk, among many other things. Emmanuel, how do we know when a model is working well and can be trusted or when it's not working well and should not be trusted? Well, that's a very good question. So typically what researchers would do uh, first of all, thanks for having me, Russ. It's, it's a, a pleasure, pleasure. To be talking with you. Um, the one tool that people use is that they will hold out data. Uh, for example, let's say I'm a company, I'm deploying a model. Let's say I'm a finance company. I think you mentioned this. I want to predict whether a stock price is going to go up or down. What I can do is I can hold up data and try to see if my model performs well on data for which I have the ground truth. Now, data that was not used to train the model, but for which I have the ground truth. And if somehow I start to see a lot of errors, you know, if my model predicts that, you know, a stock will go up when it goes down and vice versa, uh, then it might be uh, time for a refit. So uh, researchers have uh, design tools, and this is usually uh, holding out data sets about which the ground truth it is known and running the model to predict something that is already being acquired and checking performance um, versus uh, what's been really observed. And when things go out of equilibrium, um, you know, you need to pay serious attention. Yes, and, 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 and thank you for allowing me to just dive right into this issue. And we'll pull back and we'll talk about other things as well. But on this issue of holding back some data, a, a couple of things. You use the term ground truth, which I, which I take to mean this is the known answer. We, we exactly. know the answer. So that's it's what you're trying to predict. Right. Mm -hmm. um, on, on the issue of holding back data, it seems to me that there are, would be many choices about how to hold back that data. For example, there might be, for any problem, there might be some easy cases and there might be hard cases. And how well do um, practitioners of predictive models, um, I would guess that they spend a lot of time thinking about what's the uh, hardest way or the most rigorous way to test my model? Because I know that with, there's some things that I do where there's easy things that I, you could give me a hundred of them and I will have very high confidence in my ability to do that. And in other cases, the, these are very hard problems. And so, um, and, you know, 
the mix of hard versus easy could markedly change your perception of my performance. So can you talk to me a little bit about the selection of those? And, and then we'll pull back and have a more general discussion. Very good. So by the way, I should mention that this is not my area of research, but there's an area of research called active learning. And active learning is exactly what you mentioned. Let's say I try to predict a binary outcome, whether someone is going to get sick or not, depending on the factors that have measured, just as you mentioned in your opening piece. Then basically what an algorithm will do is it will try to draw, if you, my, re, my audience can see this, a decision boundary between uh -huh. the sick cases and the non-sick cases. And clearly around the boundary, this is where you have uncertainty, right? Uh -huh. So when you say, I want to hold out data, what kind of data do you want to hold out? You want to hold out data that are not deep inside the sick region and the non-sick region, but nearly around the boundary. Uh -huh. And so this is what people would do um, in active learning. They would try to select samples very carefully. You know, you, you draw and you refine a decision boundary. And this, the, the next examples you want to see to improve performance would typically be around the boundary you're about to draw, you're, you're drawing, you're in the process of drawing. And this is a very important active area of research. Yes, and, and it's good to hear because that would then guarantee that the that the evaluation of the model is happening uh, in an enriched way on all of the hard cases. Exactly, exactly. They might be easy cases, right? They might be when you see certain values of the features that you mentioned, you might say, well, this person is going to be healthy. I know that. But then there are values of the features for which you really don't know. And this is where you want to have more data. And this will actually inform future data collection. Great, You're great. Going to okay. Pick out people with these values of the feature to refine um, your boundary. So, so your own work, uh, and and thank you for answering that. Your your own work, I know, has focused a lot on the uncertainty in predictive models. And so, could you set up that problem? Uh, and, and what is the problem of uncertainty, and why should we care about it? So, when you ask me to make a prediction about the future, let's say you ask me to predict whether the Google stock is going to go up and down and by the return, like, is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? And you ask me to make a prediction. Maybe it's going to go up. My prediction is going to be go, going up to more by 2% or something like that, right? Okay. What does 2% mean, right? So what we know that whatever I'm going to tell you is not going to be the the grand truth, right? And I may say 2%, it might be 0 0.5, it might be 3% tomorrow. And so how certain I am about my prediction? You know, I'm trying to predict, as you said, the future is a hard thing. But what we would like to have is, what if we were to turn the prediction problem a bit differently? And let's say now, Russ, you ask me to not give you a single value of a prediction, but you want to ask me about a range. And so, you could say, Emmanuel, I want you to give me a range for the percent return of the Google stock tomorrow. And I want you that over the next year, you bought you 90% correct. That is 90% of the time, the value I'm gonna end up observing fall within range. And so this is about really uncertainty quantification. What I'm gonna give you, the, the goal is to give you a range of plausible values for what you're trying to predict such that 90% of the time or 95 or 99, this is gonna be depending on what the customer wants, uh, you're correct, that somehow you're within range. Okay. And so this is very important because, you know, we may live in this day and age where we think that we know more than we actually do know. You know, humans are unpredictable. And sometimes when I read the press, it seems like we've sold everything, we can predict the future, but it's not the case. And so if I, prescribe you to actually return a range that contains the true outcome 90% of the time, there are problems for which the range will be low. And that's mean that we, I, we've learned a lot about this problem. We know a lot. And sometimes it will be wide. And then we have to face the fact that we don't know so much. Yeah. And so this is what I'm going to call calibrated predictions, right? So I'm giving you a prediction that is calibrated and the calibration is that 90% of the time I'm correct or 95 or 99. So this is interesting because um, I've played games that, that are similar to this. And one of the ways you can uh, cheat 
is you give an incredibly wide range. So if you, you could say, I'll give you the Google price with 100% because it's going to be between zero and a million dollars per share. And then, and then you pat yourself on the back, but this is sure. not useful. So it seems to me that there needs to be pressure on the predictor to be as tight in their boundaries as they can be um, to keep them honest, so to speak. This is a very good point, Russ, and this is really the tension in, in, in statistical learning between the two types of error, right? First, I want the true outcome to fall within the predicted range, but I don't want the predicted range to be too wide, right? right. And this yeah. is how we're going to judge algorithm. It might be that if I use a good predictor, like let's say a fancy neural net, my range will be low, whereas if I use something a bit more naive, the range will be wide. And by the way, if we, you and I, we can guarantee that 90% of the time the outcome falls within range, and that's a prescription. Looking at the, the width of the predictive interval might be a way to compare algorithms. I'm going to prefer an algorithm that has shorter widths because it has learned better from previous yes. examples what the future looked like. Yes. Okay. That, so that really is very, very helpful. Um, uh, and, and tell me, which are the application areas? I know that you think about these issues from a somewhat abstract because in, right. in some way, many of these problems to a statistician look the same. There's the features, there's the predictor, but do you find that there are certain application areas that are more compelling for you in terms of triggering how you think about this uncertainty quantification or are they all about the same? No, I think there are applications where we make decisions based on past data that inform, you know, that have enormous consequences about our lives. Uh, these are extremely important to me. So you mentioned important things. You mentioned recidivism. You mentioned whether you're going to repay a loan or not. And so if I'm a bank and I want to know what fraction of a loan a person is going to repay, the fraction of the loan I'm about to issue, you know, I would like to have a valid range. I would like to have a range so that I can make a decision with whether to issue a loan. And I'm going to br bring another topic, which is a topic that is uh, discussed enormously at the moment in machine learning and AI as we deploy algorithms more and more to make decisions about our lives. You want these decisions, this what previous data tells you about the future, to be sort of unbiased. You don't want to discriminate against individuals. And that is something that is becoming very important to me, right? What if I have an algorithm that makes good predictions for white people, but not good prediction for non-white people, or right. good predictions for males and not good predictions for females? And so we want to avoid that. So these applications are important. They are very important. So, so do you imagine that we might, so uh, building off what you just said, we might have models where the uncertainty interval that you were describing before might be very tight for say white males, either because you had a lot of data or because the data that is elected to be um, collected is, is biased in some way, but it might for women or for um, African-American males might be a much wider uh, range. But in addition to the wideness of the range, it may be that it's off center, that, it, that, the, that the estimate in the middle is not even correct. So how good are we these days at recognizing these issues and uh, kind of making up for those problems. So we're working on this. So I think you're bringing a very good point. So typically when you work on health applications where you want to predict a health outcome from features you can measure today. And if you're actually trying to report honest predictive intervals, are these, again, these ranges that are guaranteed to be, you know, covering the true value 90% of the time or 95% of the time. When we look at health, what we realize is that the intervals for male is shorter than for female. There is there's more uncertainty for female than for male. And there's huh. a simple reason for this, is that we, NIH and other institutions, collected data about white males for a very long time. Yeah. And we have far less data about females. And this is reflected in the width of the uncertainty. We, can, we know less about female health than we know about men health. And so just by looking at the width of these intervals, as you were mentioned before, it raises a big question. It says, it's about time we collect data about you know, underrepresented groups and about females, because we know far less about them than we know about people like me. Is, yes, is there a science of 
selection of the features. So you, you've, we've been talking about features as if they're these floating around things, but actually, you know, there's either a questionnaire or a device making measurements and some engineer or scientist or person needed to decide what information we're going to collect. And I would guess that the, what you collect is going to markedly Im impact the performance and including the performance on different subgroups. How good are we at picking features that are fair and useful and informative? Um, okay, so I can't speak for every field. It's a, it's a tough question. I, I think you, you said it very nicely in the opening uh, section. You said, uh, you know, we are digitizing our lives and today we collect everything. And we asking statisticians like myself to sift through all the things we collect to pick out the important features, the important yes. attributes. And it's a tough problem. Uh, we're making some progress, but not a whole lot of progress. Uh, how do you fish out in a sea of irrelevant variables, the irrelevant factors, the ones that are important? Uh, there's a lot of work being done, but I think it's by no means a mature field at the moment. One so of the it's an important yeah. problem. One of the things that you hear all the time is uh, correlation does not mean causation. And, okay. and, and let me so and what they mean by that is sometimes you might have a feature that is correlated with the outcome of interest in the sense that they both go up and down together, but it really is not related to why that uh, outcome of interest is going up and down. In fact, they might have they both depend on the same higher level concept. So let me ask you is. Um, do we care about features, whether they're correlated or actually in the causal chain? Um, or is it really more about getting the performance and sometimes a correlated feature might be perfectly good for prediction, even though it has nothing to do with the underlying reasons. So just to make this a little bit more, uh, you might find that um, somebody's, um, you might find that somebody's, uh, uh, well, this has happened where somebody's, uh, ethnic background correlates with their uh, ability to pay back loans. And it turns out that this is not related to what their ethnic background is. It has to do with the fact that they come from a socioeconomic background that is less advantaged. And so we might in incorrectly make inferences about ethnic background that is irrelevant. So what do we do about that correlation causation issue? And I know it's a big issue. Yeah, it's a big issue. I think, I think the problem when you rely too much on on correlations is you tend to maintain the status quo, right? you know, like for example, a famous example is that, you know, there's a correlation between your gender and being a programmer, a, a good programmer. And it's because, you know, the industry has hired a lot of, uh, of male programmers. Yes. And, and perhaps at the that's a good example. Yes. At the expense of females, but perhaps there's nothing about your gender that makes you a good programmer. So the problem is when we rely on this, correlations, we tend to maintain the status quo. You know, we have made, we have perhaps reached a place. And when we learn from this correlation, the point is that we maintain the status quo. And that's, I think that's dangerous. Another problem with just correlations versus causation is that you can have breakdowns, you know, like it could be that for a while, two time series appear to be correlated. So I think I remember a very famous example where you look at the number of non-commercial spatial launches in the US and the number of, of PhDs graduating in sociology. And you see two curves and they look exactly the same. And of course, one is not causing the other. And so the problem when you rely on things like this is that, yeah, it might have been, you know, you might have might been in luck until now, but tomorrow you have no guarantees. And so one thing that is very important in learning today is, is the robustness. You know, how am I going to make sure when things change a bit, right? When the models, when the natures of things change, that so somehow what I've seen in the past will continue to happen in the future. You bring a very good point. When you have causal variables, you know, causal causality does not disappear into thin air. Correlations might. And so if I have a model that has somehow causal variables and I'm learning from causal variables, it's extremely important because I have a sense that my model will be more robust. It will be more robust. It will be less brittle. It will, the chance that it collapses will be diminished. And so of course, if you have variables, you have reason to believe I have a causal effect, you should by all means mean them because use them because it's gonna bring you robustness. 
This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. More with my guest, Professor Emmanuel Candes, about predictive models, risk assessment, and more next on Sirius XM. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Emmanuel Candace, and we're talking about predictive modeling and the uh, the ins and outs and bugaboos of, of trying to predict things. So uh, I would like to move a little bit to some applications of this work. Our, our discussion in the first segment was very theoretical. We didn't actually talk a lot about specific applications, but I know that some of your work was uh, applied to the 2020 uh, presidential election. So can you give me the setup of what was what happened and and how did it go? Yeah, so thanks a lot for bringing this up. By the way, I should mention that this is work done by Lenny Bronner and John Sherian, who work for the data science desk at the Washington Post, and they adopted our ideas, but I think the credit uh, should go to them. So as uh, people remember, uh, November 4th, you know, was our election, and a lot of eyes were on Pennsylvania and on some key states. And so what happened during the election is that some counties reported their, their votes. And so, you know, we can take the state of Pennsylvania, all uh, counties had stopped voting, but some of them started to report their votes. And so these are my examples. This is the data I have we were talking about. So counties have features, you know, is it a rural country, is it a rural country, county or not? Is it populated or not? What is the social, the income level in that county? And a lot of factors that, you know, characterize a county. And so the prediction problem here is very important, which is I observe, I don't know, 50 or 60 counties reporting, there are maybe 140 outstanding counties that have not reported yet. What yeah. do I expect at the end of the election? And so is this a predictive problem, right? So there is an outcome, which is a total number of votes for Joe Biden and the total number of votes for um, President Trump at the end of um, once every county will have reported, and can you make a prediction about this? And, and just to interject, this was quite important because nobody expected this to be finished on election night. Exactly. And so there was great, great interest in any kind of prediction of what they were going to find once the week or two weeks passed of counting. Exactly. And so what the model did is used the reported counties to predict the counties that have not yet reported but because this is a, such a sensitive application, it was very important to produce error bars, like to quantify uncertainty. Yes. And so what the Washington Post did, they used our models with some twist, obviously, to give a range for the total number of votes favoring Biden once everything has been counted and the total number of votes favoring Trump once everything has been counted with these ranges. And the ranges were calculated such that you know, you were 90% sure that, you know, the total tally would fall within um, within range. And so to go back to what you were saying before, I thought that the Washington Post conveyed extremely well what they knew about the election once everything is counted. And so they actually represented uncertainty in terms of a very clever coloring scheme. And they were showing their reader very uh -huh. accurately where we think the election uh, is going to end up. And dark colors, I mean, that's, I think we, are going to end up, but then, you know, there were gradients of color, and this is like playing the yes. role of uncertainty. And what we could see that early on, the Washington Post was correctly predicting that Joe Biden will come ahead, but it was giving you a sense of how sure it was that it would be the case. And I mentioned this because it's an important application. It's an important application because the cost of being wrong here is high. And yes. so you want transparency to your readers, and the Washington Post did its best to predict what it knew about the final outcome as best as it could and as, as transparently as it could. And I think they did a superb job. Did, uh, just out of curiosity, did they continue to use the model as the number of uh, precincts increased? And I would guess then that the bars of uncertainty get That's smaller right. and smaller and smaller. And That's how did that go? Were they, were they consistently within the range? Did they ever jump out and then jump back in? No, 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 I think you're exactly right. So as the precincts were reporting, uh, of course, the predictions changed, first of all, because we're more sure about it. And because since we have new yes. data, so we can. And you're right that the uncertainty uh, got narrower and narrower and so they were recalculating these things all the time. And so you could see that you had a bar or you, could, you don't see my hands because we're on the right. radio, <laughs> but you could see that you had intervals and at some point they, start, they stopped overlapping. And so the post was really sure that uh, Biden will come ahead. And so 
I should say that what's exciting about this work and the work that they've done is that unlike a lot of models in statistics, uh, basically these methods make no assumptions on you know, the data generating mechanism or the algorithms you use to make predictions. And so there, there was a nice quote by my uh, colleague, John Sherian. He said, uh, it's easier to go to bed at night when you use an algorithm that makes no assumption rather than right. you make a lot of assumptions about the world. And so- Because then you have to track all those assumptions. And if there's evidence that they're violated, exactly. your model kind of goes out the window. Exactly. And so the post actually was correct in all of its predictions, as far as I know. And I've been told that they will use this model because it behaves so well uh, during the week, the first week of November, ah. that they will use it for future elections. So out of curiosity, how long did it take Pennsylvania to finally do the final count? Uh, about four days. I think okay. we knew the result, if I remember correctly, November 7th, I think was yes. a Saturday. And that's what I think when Pennsylvania declared. Uh, and so... And the model, you know, ran live from November 4th to November 7th, updating itself each right. time precincts would right. start reporting. Yeah. So that, that is, a, that is a, great, a great story and a great victory for this kind of modeling. I actually wanted to go a little bit more. You said that the, um, that the Washington Post guys did, a, people did a really good job um, kind of conveying these uncertainties. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to ask you about, because uh, you've made the very good point during our conversation that these uh, intervals are in many ways much more important and useful than the actual middle of the interval, that one point estimate. But I have, uh, I have dealt with a wide range of, of people in my life. And I know that there are differences in people's ability to understand statistics. It's just having to do with their education and how much they've been exposed to uncertain things. And so does that become an issue in terms of uh, everybody might know 50-50, but people might be less confident with, I think it's 50-50, but it could be 46-54. It could be 40, you know, 52-48. Um, how difficult is it in, in your experience to get people to understand and appreciate the value of these uh, error boundaries when you do these uncertainty calculations? Um, um, I think it's a bit more difficult, as you correctly mentioned. I think people have a, a, a harder time dealing with uncertainty than they have with point estimates, but I think we'll get there. I think, um, I think what's good about what we're discussing is you're really uh, trying to give an interval for something that is not abstract. This is a thing that you want. It's not a parameter in an obscure model, like sometimes maybe right. I'm guilty of this. You know, I teach statistics student and I give confidence interval about parameters that sometimes, honestly, I'm not even sure what I'm doing. Uh, but here it's about something you can actually touch. You know, it's a number of votes for Biden. It's a number of votes for Trump. And so, I think people understand that, you know, you're 90% sure that the, you know, will be within that range and for Trump will be within that range. I think it's something that is a bit easier to grasp. And I think it's important. It's important because when you want to make decisions, let's say, you know, um, I, I work at Stanford, as you mentioned, and, you know, we get a lot of applications. And so it might be that at some point we're going to have to use uh, risk assessment tools to help the um, admission officers. You know, for example, mm -hmm. one thing mm -hmm. might be to predict the performance of a student if accepted to Stanford, right? But we can imagine that in these cases where the decisions are so monumental about the life of someone that we may want to have intervals. That is, you know, I don't know how the student, let's be honest, I don't know how the students will be, will do it if admitted to Stanford. But here is a, a range where I think this student will end up being into. And I hope that we can understand these ranges. And if they're wide, so be it. It means that I don't really know about what's going to happen. And that's what I like about this uncertainty is that when you look at the width, say, well, maybe I have not learned so much right. about past data and I have to be honest about it. And before I outsource everything to an algorithm, right? You know, let's realize that maybe there's more work to be done. Thank you for listening to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the SiriusXM app.